Six months ago today, the steady eruption cycle at Kilauea Volcano changed when this incredible fissure tore open the ground in the Middle East Rift Zone. Before that, the public had known the most recent eruption activity through its summit lava lake, an active ocean entry at Kalapana, and restless Pu'uo'o crater in between. Homes in the Kalapana Garden subdivision were on alert, but when the earthquakes on the rift zone began to rattle the area continually, it looked like a change was coming. Scientists in charge, Jim Kawahikawa. There were several um, months of earthquakes, actually. You know, decent size ones, magnitude three or so. And, uh, but really the, the sign that something had started was uh, tilt, which and we have most of our uh, important data streams alarmed. So we get uh, text messages or emails or something. Uh, <clears throat> in one of our data streams, we actually have it also hooked up to an automatic dialer. So it will call our phones in case, you know, internet doesn't work or something. But yeah, we all know what our jobs are. And uh, <clears throat> um, basically once somebody, once everybody hears that uh, an event is going on, um, we all look at our various data streams. We, the first thing that happened was that deflation uh, tilt meter on the north flank. Um, and that kind of alerts you to look at the camera and that, oh, you know, you see that the, the floor is kind of dropping out from under it. When the first video of the March 5th Kamoamoa fissure was released, the world got a glimpse of the power of Kilauea, commonly known for its peaceful eruptions. But as geophysicist Mike Pollan explained at a recent After Dark at the Park talk at Kilauea Visitor Center, this video, captured by a heroic Hawaiian volcano observatory scientist, was nearly more than was bargained for. So we sent out this uh, geologist in this helicopter, and he overflew Pu'uo'o, and noticed that, yeah, the crater floor is gone. But he didn't notice anything else in his first pass. And then he was over Pu'uo'o, and he and the pilot looked over their shoulders, a little bit uprift, and they saw a fissure eruption that had just started. So what did they do? Like any good geologist, he landed, and he took a video. Check this out. This is what he saw. Keep your eye on this area here. It's starting to steam, and on this area here. The cracks are getting bigger. You'll see chunks fall in. And you'll see now it's starting to spatter right there. More and more gas coming out. A real big chunk is about to fall in right here. Yep, you can see lava right there. There's the, here's the, here goes the big chunk. There's, there's the spatter there. There it goes. And it's time to move. <laughs> For a volcanologist, this is about the coolest thing in the world. Having a fissure eruption almost, you know, that's, uh, that's stunning. The first journalist to capture the images of the Kamoamoa eruption was volcanographer Mick Kalber, who brought the world this defining footage. For Mick, a moment like this will never get old. It's a visceral experience to watch this. You know, it's so organic. It's the birth of the Earth. If video like this is still a thrill for a volcano veteran like Kalber, imagine what Marco Hernandez thought filmed that same night by Calber flying this helicopter in the foreground. It was Hernandez's first charter flight over a Hawaiian volcano. Everybody was pretty happy for me, I think, to have that on my first day. I didn't really have much to compare it to. I hadn't really had any experience with volcanoes prior to that. But seeing that eruption, uh, I knew it was something special and, and kind of a as the other helicopter showed up on the scene and there was lots of talk on the radio, very quickly, you know, I, I heard people who, who've been flying out here for 15, 20 years that they were seeing, seeing this stuff for the first time. They'd never seen anything like it. And I kind of keyed in pretty quick that this was special. And by the time I got there, uh, Calvin Joy, my boss, was actually already there in one of our other helicopters, the 407, with a film crew. Yeah, they were doing uh, film work, and I just kind of happened to be at the right place at the right time and got some pretty neat photos of the, the Hughes 500 with the volcano in the background. But that wouldn't be Marco's last look at a major eruptive event. He took Calber up in the helicopter a few months later to help capture the most recent Pu'uo'o vent breakout in August. With the incredible March 5th Kamoamoa fissure eruption on the East Rift Zone, attention was diverted from Kilauea's usual show at the summit. 
But when the lava lake at Halima'uma'u drained away, some recalled the worst case concerns of an explosive eruption. The disappearance was similar to the accounts of a lava lake draining in 1924 that resulted in a violent summit eruption that caused one person's death and doubled the width of Halima'uma'u, or worse, the 1790 explosion that is believed to have killed over 80 Hawaiians who were traveling some miles away. Scientists say that thankfully the events were different in a very important way. Um, there were important, very important differences to the two events. This withdrawal of the summit lava lake was in no way similar to the one in, nine, in 1924. The lava lake had actually drained weeks before the explosive eruption, so it was speculated that the lava had actually withdrawn below the local water table, which is rather high. And at that point, even now, we see that when the lava um, recedes, it weakens the walls and the walls start collapsing in. And so the idea in 1924 is that lava must have receded below the water table, allowing water to enter the vent. And so the explosions were what's called phreatic, basically uh, ground water flashing into steam and exploding that way. Now that six months have passed, what do scientists have to say about the spectacular Kamoamoa Fisher eruption? Well, I, you know, they're all spectacular. Um, and probably the most spectacular one will be the last one, the most recent one. If your scientist in charge, Jim Kawahikawa, one word could be cool. But that one was pretty cool. So that was uh, out there in 97 when uh, the previous one occurred in that area. <clears throat> and that was only a little less than 24 hours. Uh, this one went on for four days. And that was part of the coolness in that, uh, you know, we, we kind of knew what had happened in 97. And so we were right on it with the Kamomo Fisher uh, doing the mapping and, and the sampling. And, um, and we really got. Uh, a good data set out of that would really help us figure out what went on. Data that, as geophysicist Mike Pollan says, helps define what appears to be a definite pattern at Pu'u'o'o. One of my colleagues actually described this as the East Rift Zone had a conduit aneurysm. Maybe a little graphic and colorful, but it's not a bad way to describe this. The, the, the conduit ruptured. Magma had to get out there, and it's perhaps not surprising that it happened right there because historically, that's the most active part of the East Rift Zone. It is the weakest link in the, I almost said goodbye. It is the weakest link in the Rift Zone. We're still sticking magma into to Kilauea. It's got to go somewhere. And right now, it's filling Pu'u'u'u'u. So I said this a few times, and I'm not afraid to say it again. This is only going to end one way. Promising that the show is far from over at Kilauea Volcano. Tim Bryan, Big Island Video News.